Welcome. This is TCT 2021. I am Chang Nam from Gaming University, Korea. And this session is abstract session five, currently three. We will have uh, uh, five uh, excellent abstract presentation. My co-moderator is uh, Dr. Paul Young, and we have three excellent panelists. Dr. Uh, R.M. Seriong, and Dr. Rhee, and Dr. Park. And then Dr. Paul Ong will introduce each abstract, please. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. So without further ado, uh, can I invite Dr. Li Yusun to give us this first uh, presentation. The topic is gonna to be on are diabetic patients with above 0 0.8 FFR really safe? Over to you, please. Uh, thank you, I appreciate the kind introduction. Good, uh, hello, my name is Kyusun Lee from Seoul National University Hospital in Korea. Today, I will, I will brief you on my study on progress uh, about the uh, uh, clinical outcomes in uh, according to the FFR grade in the diabetes patient. Uh, I have nothing disclosed. It, uh, it is well known that multiple factors associated with the diabetic mellitus contribute to the development of atherosclerotic plug and rapid progression. Cardiac CT as the imaging modality can provide a qualitative and quantitative assessment of a coronary plug burden detected distinct high-risk morphological plug features. Uh, FFR is a physiologic index to define the myocardial uh, ischemia. Previous study in our laboratory shows that the functionally relevant six features were associated with the low FFR and the clinical outcomes. In addition to low FFR, according to the, our preliminary data, uh, uh, clinical events still occur in, in, in FFR above uh, 0, uh, 0.8. However, this is reasons, uh, this reasons remains unclear yet. Uh, therefore, we assume that uh, this event will occur in mainly a diabetic population. The coronary plague features would be related to occurrence of the clinical event. So to, to prove this hypothesis, we uh, first we compare the five clinical outcomes between the patient with and without the diabetes. And second, we investigate the difference of the plug characteristics and the burden. And lastly, uh, assess the association between the plug feature and clinical outcome between two groups. This study is the purpose and the post hoc subgroup uh, analysis based on the CSTA and FFR multicenter registry. A total of 747 patients with suspected coronary artery disease were enrolled in this registry. All of these patients underwent uh, coronary CT angiography and FFR. Among them, uh, 309 patients with 802 vessels were deferred of PCI. We divided into two groups according to the FFR range. The coronary CT angiography images were analyzed to, to obtain the qualitative and quantitative plug, plug feature. The primary and uh, the primary end point uh, was five-year vessel oriented composite outcomes defined as uh, uh, com uh, defined uh, as composite of cardiac deaths and best related myocardial inf uh, infarction, best re related driven the uh, uh, revascularization. This table shows the baseline characteristics. The main, uh, the mean age was 65 to 66, male predominant. The, uh, the percentage of a patient with hypertension and dyslipidemia were uh, significantly higher in the patient with the diabetes. In clinical presentation, there is a statistically significant difference in two groups. In, in patient with the diabetes, FFR is slow, uh, uh, slightly low and diameter stenosis was greater than those with patients without diabetes. This slide shows the five clinical outcomes of FFR grade deferral of PCI according to the diabetes status. The risk of BOCO and the MACE are uh, significantly greater about the 3.4 times and 2.8 times in patients with diabetes, diabetes compared with the patient without diabetes respectively. This result shows the deferral of PCI in patients with diabetes have a poor clinical outcomes. Next, we further investigate the whether clinical outcomes is different according to the FFR range. As a result, there is there is a, uh, a statistically significant difference of a vocal rate between two groups in FFR above 
0 0.9 or less. This, big, uh, this figure shows the relationship between the risk of BOCO and the FFR in the flow of PCI. This result indicate that the lower the FFR value, the greater the diabetic mellitus effect in clinical outcomes. Next, we compare the plug of features between two groups according to the uh, FFR range. As a result, uh, fiber fatty, uh, fiber fatty necrotic core volume and plug burden and percent adrenal volume and spot, spotty classifications were uh, significantly greater in the in the patient with the diabetes. The significant difference is also uh, partially maintained uh, in FFR above 0 0.8 to 0 0.9 or less. However, uh, only a, a fiber fat and necrotic core volume shows the significant difference in high FFR. Previous study reported that the component of high risk vessel characteristics, which uh, is compo uh, composed of uh, fiber and necrotic core volume, percent of thermal volume, plug volume uh, is well uh, predicting vocal rate in the FFL above uh, 0.8. So we, we analyzed the five year vocal risk according to the number of high risk vessel characteristics between two groups. The risk of vocal increased in the diabetic patient with one uh, one or more high risk vessel uh, characteristics compared with a patient without diabetes. However, this significant difference appeared uh, disappeared in the between the two groups without uh, high uh, high risk vessel characteristics. This res uh, this result suggested that the number of high risk vessel plug characteristics are important factors influence five year occur in the patient with the diabetes mellitus and the flow of a PCI. This slide is a discuss discussion point. Uh, first, among the diabetic patients with deferral PCI, a vocal event were higher in the diabetic patient with a paper between the uh, 0.8 to 0.9. In, uh, in therapy perspective, what is the optimal medical uh, optimal therapeutic strategy in the diabetic patient in 0.2 to 0.9 or less? Optimal medical therapy with risk control, uh, factor control, or revascularization. Second, uh, is coronary CT angiography as the initial screen test for plug evaluation required for in this patient? This is slide my uh, last slide. Uh, the patient with the diabetes mellitus uh, and deferral of PCI shows poor clinical outcomes compared with the uh, patient without diabetes. There is the difference in clinical outcomes according to the FFR range in patients with diabetes. Number, number of high risk vessel characteristics associated with the five uh, year book risk in diabetic patient with FFR above FFR 0.8. FFR guided deferral of PCI in this uh, in patient with diabetes does not appear uh, to be as safe as in patient without diabetes. Thank you for attention. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee, for this uh, very interesting and very relevant clinical uh, presentation. Um, maybe I will uh, open the discussion. Maybe Dr. Lee, can I ask you to stop sharing your screen first? Uh, maybe we can invite our uh, very excellent panelists uh, to contribute uh, to the discussion. Um, perhaps I can invite uh, my good friend, Dr. Tanya Rat from Thailand um, to give some comments about this case. Thank you for your great presentation and congratulations with your results. I think uh, it is very interesting study because as we know that the patient who have diabetes have a, a high risk uh, for the cardiac event uh, and your result got the uh, same as we know. But uh, I think this is uh, create a new uh, idea that uh, you think you would like to uh, maybe do the normal range of FFR as your hypothesis that uh, the patient who have uh, diabetes should be have FFR uh, not less than 0.9, right? Yes. And yes. do you have right. any uh, evidence that uh, if you do the uh, PCI on this kind of patient and the result will be better? 
Um, but still, the, I, 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 have, I have no evidence in this uh, problem. Because I think because of the patient who have diabetes, uh, whatever you do, uh, the result is will be uh, worse than patient who did not have. So then this is just a conclusion that uh, the patient that have diabetes and uh, that have uh, FFR more than uh, less than 0.8 is have a poor uh, prognosis than the patient who have uh, uh, FFR greater than 0.8, right? That's it. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, um, yeah, I think that intensive medical therapy and the risk of factor modification and regular screening tests should be done as a, a first line treatment strategy in this patient. However, based on our results, there is the possibility that the PCI may be the beneficial in this patient. However, further uh, study needed to be confirmed that where the PCI is superior to medical ma management in diabetes patient with FFR, especially above 0.8 to 0.9 or less. Yeah, very excellent uh, presentation. Uh, Thank you. Last year, I have a chance to uh, uh, show the paper in Jack uh, intervention about a very similar concept. So yes. when you do the uh, FFR by the deeper in some region, but the plaque, uh, that region has a large plaque burden or diabetes, their yes. out long-term outcome is very poor. But unfortunately, we don't have any kind of uh, uh, evidence about the PCI will be better for that kind of re uh, current region. So we, yes. will, we have to wait until the randomized trial about the, the kind of uh, region subset will be beneficial with the PCI. So uh, right now, we don't, uh, we don't have that kind of evidence. Therefore, we have to do the intensive medical care and then uh, close observation for, during the Korean car pilot period. I guess it's probably in, in diabetic patients, from the message I got is your threshold of bringing intracorneal imaging is probably going to be lower, isn't it? Yeah. Maybe I think in the interest of time, maybe I can pass it back uh, to my co-chair to introduce the next speaker. Okay, I will introduce the second uh, abstract. Dr. Nao Yasuda, uh, she will present assess, uh, assessment of a diagnostic accuracy by each resting index comparison with FFR. Please, Dr. Yasuda. I'm Nao Yasuda from Nagoya XI Kai Hospital. My presentation today is assessment of diagnostic accuracy by each resting index comparison with FFR. Background, strategy based of physiological assessment by IFRs for coronary artery disease has got quite familiar. Recently, RFR and DPR were introduced as the other non hyperemic indices and show strong correlation with IFR, respectively. But there are not many clinical reports. So, our purpose of this study was to evaluate, compare resting indices with FFR and estimate diagnostic accuracy of itself. Method. Study design was a single center retrospective cohort study. A total of consecutive 1,008 regions was enrolled who underwent both FFR and resting index due to stable angina factories during September 2014 to October 2020. We divided regions by coronary vessels and assessed correlation between each resting index and FFR, and analyze diagnostic ability of each resting index for assessing FFR by receiver operating characteristic curve. Result, IFR group has slightly less medical history in LAD regions. RFR group had diabetic patients little more than others in LCX regions. There were no differences in RCA regions. Correlation coefficient of DPR is 0 0.8, so that DPR was strongest correlation with FFR in LAD. In 
LCX, the correlation coefficient of DPR was 0.9, so the DPR was strongest correlation with FFR, similarly in LAD. In RCA, correlation coefficient of IFR and FFR were 0.78, so they were equally strong correlation with FFR. The agnostic ability of these resting indices for assessing FFR were quite good and all equally in LAD. Cut-off value shows of value shows in graphs, it was a little bit low in DPR group. In LCX, diagnostic ability of IFR and DPR were high, and cutoff value was a little different in RFR group. In RCA, diagnostic ability of IFR and DPR showed high too but each resting index has different cutoff value for FFR. These values were higher than well-known cutoff value 0.89. DPR showed a stronger correlation with FFR and had superior diagnostic accuracy for assessing FFR compared to the others. Each resting index had different different cutoff value for FFR. Especially in RCA, it was suggested that each resting index has less correlation with FFR. Discussion. It has been reported that every resting indices which assessed only diagnostic period has good correlation with IFR. And RFR which assess all cycle period is also similar. They assessed one resting index and estimated the other resting indices in silico retrospectively by using the same pressure data. The calculation of each resting index has difference in the each original algorithm depending on their definition, calibration method, structure of wire, pressure sensor, which may affect on the differences. These, they are physiological differences between LCA and RCA. It has been reported that the timing of maximum blood flow velocity is different between LCA and RCA, and blood flow in RCA is less than in LAD. It has started to be reported that physiological features were independent predictor of discrepancy between resting indices each listing, in, each listing index may have differences by target vessels. Only IFR has a clinical evidence for ischemic assessment at the present time. Further in the investigation about each listing index should be performed. Conclusion, each listing index may have a difference in accuracy for FFR. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for a great uh, presentation. So uh, now uh, we, we are often to discussion of this uh, presentation. Any uh, comment or question from panelists? Uh, congrats, 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 I'm Dr. Lee from Taipei. Uh, I think you raised an interesting topic about different resting index compared to the traditional FFFR. But uh, uh, I think maybe because of the limited number size, maybe it's still too uh, early to say it's uh, different or it's the same between the uh, three types of resting indexes. But my question is, uh, your uh, data is quite consistent to the previous concept like uh, the, the index, the FFR is uh, more accurate for the LAD lesions, but uh, maybe uh, regarding the spatial relationship, 
for the LCX and the LCA, the value is not so consistent. Well, uh, value of these two kinds of vessels. And I, I think your data is still uh, based on this uh, concept. So my question is for you is, do you think if the value in your data you emphasize the DPR is stronger uh, correlation to the FFR. What kind of uh, uh, methods will make uh, your hypothesis uh, possible? I mean, if the DPR is really better, uh, which kind of uh, the which kind of the reason you will convince us? Uh, thank you for your question. Mm. Oh. You mean uh, why DPR is is better? better. Uh, I think uh, wire of DPR of wire is better than other two wires, so they have they have less noise or uh, drift. So this is one reason why. DPR, DPR's value is good correlation for FFR, I think. So do you believe that is related to the technical issue within the uh, different kind of a uh, pressure wire or uh, the, the mechanical uh, or uh, some other theoretical difference? Both, I think both is the reason. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, because of a time limitation, even though it's, uh, we have uh, just one question, but uh, we will move to the next abstract. Thank you. So, mm -hmm. Dr. Yong. Can we move away from Korea and Japan and actually we will invite our colleague from Mongolia to give us the next uh, uh, presentation. Um, Dr. Guyan Kishik, I hope I get your name right, um, is going to talk about the prognostic impact of residual syntax score after a successful PCI of the left main bifurcation stenosis. So over to you. Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Ayo uh, I work for Intermet Hospital Mongolia. I am appreciative to participate in, in this TCT conference. I am happy to share our study with you today. Our topic is prognostic impact of residual syntax score after successful precutaneous coronary intervention of a left main coronary artery bifurcational stenosis. Uh, we don't have any, any conflict of interest. Uh, our study aim is uh, uh, is to clarify if uh, the impact of residual syntax score after uh, successful uh, percutaneous coronary intervention of a late main coronary artery by frequential stenosis on patients' long term prognosis. Um, we use the following methods of a study, and our study is retrospective of durational cohort study. Uh, it was held during the period from 2017 to 2020. Uh, total number of patients in the wallet in our study uh, 78. And we calculated them both as a baseline syntax score and residual syntax score for every patient. And we used Cox's proportional hazard recreation analysis and couple my curve. Uh, now uh, let's look at the basic characteristics, uh, characteristics of patients. Uh, the average age of patients in 60 and um, minus plus in 11. There was in 63 male and 15 female patients. Uh, 58 patients showed in hypertension, uh, 70 of all patients had in diabetes mellitus, and 29 of them had in previous MI. 
uh, seven patients had um, chronic kidney disease, uh, 31 patients are active smokers, and 47 patients are former smokers. Uh, now uh, we can see an angiographic characteristics um, for bifurcational uh, for bifurcational lesion type. Uh, for uh, the most patient we are showing uh, one one zero type, which was in taken forty seven point one percent, and twenty eight patient we are showing one 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 type. For pre-procedures and TIMI flow grade, we can see following numbers in here. The median uh, uh, median of your syntax, uh, pre-syntax score was in 28 uh, minus plus in 9.2. Uh, median of any residual in syntax score to minus plus in 3.1. Uh, procedural and characteristics, um, we uh, use it in the uh, following technique. Uh, we can see in post procedural TIMI uh, result, uh, 70, uh, 75 patients resulted in TIMI 3 grade, and uh, all the three patients in, uh, show TIMI. Uh, too great. Um, Medina classification and post procedural cell syntax score was not associated with all costs in mortality in the long term. Also, Kaplan-Meier curve estimation didn't show a significant difference between patients with their cell syntax score one and our uh, uh, sorry syntax score zero and our in one. So, a successful PCI of a left main coronary artery bifurcational stenosis substantially decreases total syntax score. Residual syntax score after PCI of left main coronary artery bifurcational stenosis is not related to long term patient prognosis. Okay, it was my presentation, and uh, let me finish in here. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for this really interesting study looking at left main bifurcation. Can I maybe ask um, Dr. Park Yong Ha from Korea, our esteemed panelist, uh, to comment on this abstract, please? Yes. Congratulations, Dr. Priyan Shikin, for the nice presentation. Uh, although you calculated with the residual syntax score with the binary sprint as Joe or one and more, but previous many studies used the residual synthesis score have divided into more than three groups for better risk classification. So I wonder, have you tried grouping residual synthesis score with more subdivided group for the better risk stratification? Yes, uh, thank you for your question. Uh, um, yes, you're correct. Uh, we didn't uh, divide it in uh, restore syntax score and divide in, and, and didn't uh, classify it. Uh, we have done uh, just in 75 uh, patients, uh, but it is um, our team's uh, maybe a limitation. So another comment is when use the raised your syntax score. Uh, if you combine with the baseline syntax score, you will get better risk of stratification than used with each score itself. Maybe the numbers is small, which is obviously is, is uh, exploring ideas here. Okay, okay please. Interest. Yeah. Yes, yes, I, yes, I agree. Um, maybe any, any comment from my co-chair? No, yeah, uh, it's very excellent uh, abstract presentation. Uh, but as you mentioned, that uh, the uh, very limited number of patients included, so we cannot conclude uh, whether the, there is no benefit using the residual syntax score or not in this uh, current one uh, uh, study. Uh, according to previous study, uh, there is some data about the, if the residual syntax is high, uh, their outcome will be very poor. 
But uh, another issue is uh, whether, even though there is residual syntax score is high, but the, we didn't, if we use the FFR guidance, so functional residual syntax score is different concept. So even though it looks like angiography uh, significant residual disease and residual syntax score is high, but when we measure FFR, FFR is negative. If negative, it means the residual functional syntax score is zero. So in that case, it will be better to discriminate the risk group. Okay, anyway, it's very excellent uh, abstract. So we will move to the next uh, presentation. So next present will be uh, uh, Dr. Jasmine Chan, and uh, uh, she will present uh, the title, non hyperemic Pressure Ratio Demonstrate Excellent Agreement with IFR in Patient with the Severe Aortic Stenosis. Please. So my name is Jasmine Chan, and I'm representing um, Monash Health at Monash University in Australia. And today I'll be presenting on non hyperemic pressure ratios in patients with severe aortic stenosis. All right, so I've got no conflicts to disclose. So a bit about the background, aortic stenosis is the most common primary valve disease with growing prevalence to increasing aging population. Severe aortic stenosis is also associated with significant morbidity and mortality. And at present, the definitive treatment for such disease are pa um, for patients with severe AS are surgical aortic valve replacement or transcatheter valve replacement. More than 60% of patients with AS have also concomitant coronary artery disease. And therefore, assessments of these coronary, coronary lesions are crucial as untreated severe coronary artery disease are associated with adverse outcome. In a non-AS patient cohort, the use of these invasive pressure measurements such as fractional flow um, reserve in guiding revascularizations improves patient's outcome and are well incorporated in clinical guidelines for CAD. However, there are limitations um, to the uptake of FFR due to increased proce procedural time and patient discomfort secondary to hyperemic agents. This has since led to the development of non-hyperemic pressure ratios, otherwise known as NHPR. So our question is mainly looking at invasive pressure wire management in aortic stenosis. Valvular aortic sten um, sorry, valvular stenosis precipitates a cascade of structural and microcirculatory and neurohumeral changes. This results in an impairment of coronary flow reserves and myocardial ischemia, even in the absence of notable coronary stenosis. In AS, where the pathoph pathophysiological coronary alterations are noted, number one is an increase in resting coronary blood flow, and number two, a blunted hyperemic response. There is strong correlations with FFR and sorry, there is strong correlations with FFR and NHPR with equivalent diagnostic performance in coronary artery disease, but no data have been, ex um, have been explored in this relationship in AS. Therefore, our question is, does this association hold true in abnormal, abnormal resting physiological states, such as in patients with severe AS? So the methods that we've taken is a post hoc analysis that was achieved using the prospective invasive cast FFR study that was done in our institute earlier. These patients also underwent invasive pressure wire manage, um, assessment. The data were then extracted to derive instantaneous wave-free ratio, otherwise known as IFR, diastolic pressure ratios, DPR, and diastolic hyperemic free ratios. This is the pictorial reference of the um, metrics that we've used. The NHPR was then compared to the gold standard of FFR to, to, to determine the accuracy and then compared to IFR to evaluate overall agreement. These are the baseline characteristics of our population, an age of 75.3 mean, aortic gradient with a mean 44.3, dimensionless index 0.23. 67 lesions were assessed of more than half being the LAD, the minimum mean diameter stenosis was 33.9 with a lesion length of 9.7. So we found strong positive correlation between FFR and NHPR as evident in the graphs here. We also did a receiver operational curve that showed analysis that showed, um, sorry, 
uh, a receiver operator curve analysis was also performed using FFR with a cutoff of 0.8 as the gold standard, but the NHPR showed high accuracy with the area under curve values being above 0.9 for all of them, and the optimal cutoffs were found to be lower than the standard cutoff of 0.9, um, 0.89 for IFR and DPR and DFR, and all NHPR had similar positive and negative predicted values. So furthermore, we've also found excellent correlations between IFR and all NHPR. This is the graph evidence and they're all above 0.98, close to 0.98. So our discussion point is, are these data enough to reassure clinicians that NHPR can be used in patients with severe aortic stenosis to assess coronary artery disease severity. Our second point is, if we were to use this NHPR, should we reevaluate NHPR cutoff values for identification of ischemia? Thirdly, given that NHPR are independent of hyperemia, should these ratios be preferentially used in patients with severe aortic stenosis? So the conclusion of our study, our study demonstrated that even in patients with severe aortic stenosis, or NHPR demonstrates strong correlation with FFR in patients, and there is excellent agreement in between IFR and all diastolic NHPRs. Secondly, NHPRs can be used interchangeably amongst all these other rations of NHPR, and this suggests that the measurements need not be taken at the exact point of diastole as alterations in coronary physiology in AS affects diastole as a whole. Therefore, all diastolic NHPRs can be used interchangeably as IFR and can be integrated into clinical guidelines to guide revascularizations in patients with severe AS and concomitant coronary artery disease. NHPR can also be used as a safer alternative in patients who are unable to tolerate hyperemic agents. However, it's important to note that the accurate evaluation of hemodynamically significant coronary stenosis by invasive pressure managed um, assessment remains challenging in aortic stenosis. Do we consider different cutoffs or threshold values for these patient cohort? And another point to note would be the limitations of NHPR, such as pressure drift and the influence of heart rate that can lead to the sorry, misclassifications of lesion. Um, we've come to the end of my presentation. Um, is there any questions? Thank you, Isa. Excellent presentation. So now we will open the, this yep. presentation to discuss. So mm -hmm. any comments from panelists? Uh, hello. Hi. I think you uh, nicely show the correlation between NHPR uh, and the traditional FFR. But my question is uh, the, the hypothesis you have raised to say maybe aortic stenosis may uh, influence the accuracy of oh. measurement. It could also influence the accuracy of FFR. So uh, could you uh, convince us by your data, we can say uh, this kind of measurement could be applicable in the population of aortic stenosis, or we just can say this kind of measurements have high correlations between each other. Okay, so I think first, um, when we looked at FFR and IFR, I guess in theory, we think that um, in the pathophysiology of coronary, uh, sorry, in the coronary pathophysiology and aortic stenosis, there is a blunted hyperemic response and therefore FFR has a degree of um, inaccuracy to it. And I think there was a study that was done by um, Ahmad et al. that was published in Jack Interventions in 2018 shows that um, FFR changed pre and post heavy and IFR remains unchanged for a period of time. Um, however, extending that, uh, sorry, extending that on, um, I believe at a period of time, where you have a regression of your left ventricular hypertrophy, IFR may have a change as well, but it, it's, it's hard to really tell at which point does, does this affect IFR and whether you know, the slow regression or the, the, the 
gradual regression of left ventricular hypertrophy will I affect IFR at um, a, a, um, after a certain period of time. I think it's hard to really quantify this at this stage and we will need a prospective study using IFR to determine that. Does that answer your question? I'm so, sorry, you mentioned quite a bit of things. Okay, uh, do you have any question, Dr. Aram Serio? Uh, can I ask you one more question? Do yeah. you have, uh, do you measure the uh, bracing, uh, non hyper uh, bracing index in uh, ethic stenosis who have uh, after the operation or after we correct the aortic stenosis in, in your study? Uh, so we did not measure any post-TEVA patients. We mainly looked at uh, pre-TEVA patients who were undergoing the angiogram. And that was when we did the um, pressure-wise studies. But one of, the, um, one of the results that I did not show here in my study is that we found that PDPA actually did not, PDPA over the whole cycle did not correlate as well as IFR. And I wonder if it's because there was a systolic component to it. And therefore, this would be more consistent with our results that NHPRs, um, IFR and the other rations of NHPRs may be more appropriate to um, assessments of uh, stenotic lesions in aortic, in aortic stenosis. Great. Okay, so I, I think it's a, it's a lovely discussion and very good presentation. So uh, thank you, Jasmine, for that. But I want to bring in our last uh, abstract presenter here uh, is Dr. Uh, Pratap Kumar from India. He's going to talk to us about using IVIS uh, guided zero contrast PCI in patients with chronic kidney disease, uh, exploring the feasibility and short term outcome. So over to you, please. Uh, thank you, moderators and chairpersons and panelists. This is an excellent. Um, uh, Podium, just I'm getting the development of the contrast acute kidney diseases and contrast media administration in the absence of alternative etiology. An increase in the creatinine of more than 0.3, or if it is within 48 hours after the contrast exposure, or increase to more than 50% within seven days is contrast induced acute renal injury. You know that the contrast induced nephropathy. It, has, it really causes all cause mortality, not only immediately, it is even up to seven years after intervention. And the patients with the contemporary incidence and predictors and outcome of the acute kidney injury undergoing PCI in every registry, it is showing nearly 0.3% of the patients will go for a dialysis in patients in normal. But if you go with the EGFR, if it is more than less than 30, it goes up to nearly 26% of the patients will go into acute kidney injury and 4.3% of the patients will go for dialysis. This is actually mid moderate GFR versus normal or a severe GFR versus normal, you will have a high incidence of patients will go for acute kidney injury as well as permanent dialysis. This is actually seen in every data published. How to reduce the mortality? The, con the prevention is the key, and you should understand, reduce the contrast volume is the key. What is the best one? What is ultra low contrast angioplasty? If the contrast volume divided by the GFR, eGFR, if it is less than one, then it is called as the, basically the contrast volume should be less than eGFR is ultra low contrast. If it is up to three times is called low contrast. I and mean, if it is zero contrast, absolutely no contrast used. This is actually why doing three ways, we have to understand the proximal landing zone, we have to understand the distal landing zone, and from that, we have to measure the stent diameter, length, and the landing zone. And in the post IVUS, you will understand the malaposition, under expansion, and edge dissection. The procedural step is actually if you take a metallic salute with the fluoroscopic projection exactly the same as the angiogram done in the same hospital or outside. The initial eye was run across the main vessel and the side branch, especially in the left main disease. We have to prepare the lesion very well, and you have to do a repeat eye as assessment before a stent deployment. You have to do a stent deployment and no change in the fluoroscopic projection during the stent deployment. A post eye was run in side branch also in bifurcation lesions. 
you have to do a serial echocardiogram to rule out a pericardial effusion during the procedure and after the procedure. This is actually a metallic cellulite. You have a wire in the LED, you have the wire in the septal artery and the diagonal as well as the circumflex artery. When you, uh, how do you identify if there is a complication? The patient will be developing new symptoms, new electrocardiogram changes, a blood pressure drop. We have to check with the minimal contrast when the complications are suspected. I'll show you one case, a 61 year old female with a chest pain of six hours, a PCI done in 2011 with a severe LED dysfunction. Patient is a diabetic, the stage four CKD with anemia. This patient actually had an ST elevation 2-3 AVF with a global hypokinesia. This is actually the angiogram shown from outside. And showing a disease, what we did is EGFR is actually 14. So the contrast-induced nephropathy risk is 34.39 and the dialysis risk is 4.59. We actually did with a 7 French EBU with the same projection, we put a filled FC wire. You can see the next wire we actually proceeded you can see the next wire coming down. This wire we will be seeing from the next projection with the keeping the same projection. You can see the wire coming down and the second wire we have to put into the vessel with the similar angiogram in the previous dot. So you can see that the wire should be, understand the anatomy, this is another branch. So what we have taken the wire down and just taken and then proceed into the similar fashion and we understand the serial angiogram and without even checking the contrast there. We actually done this after that, we have done a balloon dilatation with a 1.5 to 15 millimeter balloon. Then first I was run done. This I was run showed the proximal vessel is the three millimeter vessel and the distal is a 2.5 and you have a calcium arc in the middle part. What we did is actually the lesion lesion length was 27.9 millimeters. And we have put a 2.5 to 13 millimeter stent there. And we actually, what we have done is placed with the fluorose tool and the fluorose image. So what we did is actually, we inflated the balloon and we did a post dilatation with a three into 12 millimeter balloon because the proximal was three millimeter. Then we did a final IVAS run again. We show it's a well expanded stent the distal stand area is 3.6 and the proximal stand area is 5.9 with an expansion of 80%. Our aim is actually, aim of the study is to assess the safety and the short-term outcome of IVS guided zero contrast PCI and CKD with a complex demographics or lesion morphology. It is a prospective single center study with the done from November 2019 to May 2020. We have calculated two things, the inclusion criteria with a significant coronary stenosis indication for revascularization. EGFR is less than 30 with a stage four and stage five CKD. With the GFR is between 30 to 45, we took a patient more than 75 years and patient with the LVEF less than 35%. These are the two criteria. So a single operator with experience of 150 LM PCI and 125 CTO PCI per year for the last five years. An informed consent taken from the patient all the, before all the procedures. And CABG was advised to appropriate patients as per the standard guidelines. A study was approved by the Institutional Ethical Committee. The technical success is actually MSA of more than 80% average lumen diameter with no significant FG dissection or malaposition and a plug burden of less than 50%. And non LMCA, we require a 5.5 millimeter square, and LMCA, we require more than 8 millimeter square. A procedural success, a technical success without in hospital mortality. We had a 22 patients with a mean age of 69.3 plus or minus 10.7. 95% of the patients were male and 81% of the patients were diabetic. We had a LVEF of 43%, and you should understand that LVEF is less than 50 in 13 patients out of 22. And the serum creatinine was 2.7 plus or minus 1.3 in all the patients. And the EGFR was 30.7. That is the mean EGFR. And the creatinine, the risk of dialysis was actually 2.1 uh, and 15.3 was the CIN risk. And this is a BMT risk. And the syntax score was 25.7 plus or minus 15.3. And the syntax score more than 23 was nearly in 12 patients and the Syndax 2 score was 44.9.
a calcium arc was present in nine patients, that is 22.5% of the lesions, 40 lesions in 22 patients. So in nine lesions, we had 22.5% of the patients at more than 180 degree arc calcium. And the LMS, MLA of the known LMCA lesion was 2.8 and LMCA was 4.2. And lesion length was 35.7 plus or minus 14.2. We had a procedure done with the femoral root in 93.3%, and one patient we have done in radial root. Naturally, that was a six French catheter. Number of wires used in per vessel was 2.5 plus or minus 0.9, and number of IVs run was 3.1 plus or minus 0.9. And microcatheters used in 12.5% of the patients, and cutting balloon used in 22.5% of the patients, and a guide extension was used in three patients. And number of stents per vessel was 1.4 plus or minus 0.6. LMCA lesion was in eight patients and LMCA bifurcation was done in three patients, three lesions, that is 7.5%. And rotation laparectomy was done in four patients and CTO was in two patients. And ISR PCI was in one patient. The technical success was 95% and procedural success was 95%. All the patients had a procedural success, but two patients, we had to use a small contrast of dye. It made it become an ultra low contrast because the patient had chest pain during the procedure and patient had knee CG changes. The complex subsets was LMCA to LAD was eight patients. Bifurcation was in three. A rotation was done in four patients, two CTOs. Lesion were LMCA to LAD in eight, LAD was 11, RCA was nine patients. No pericardial effusion, no stent thrombosis, no urgent cabbage, no blood transfusion, no in-hospital mortality. And CI incidence was zero in all the patients. 90 days follow-up, 90 days, all the patients were asymptomatic and stable without any events. There was no significant increase in the triatal levels and none of the patients required dialysis. We continued this study. Now we came up to 30 patients so far. I was guided zero contrast PCI is feasible and safe in CAD with CKD. And the technique can be used safely in patients with a high risk for CI contrast induced AKD. And in centers where there is an expertise for the performance of complex PCI with intravascular image guidance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for a really good uh, presentation on the use of minimal or no contrast in this group of very challenging patients. Um, our centre do see quite a lot of these patients and one of the things that we tend to do is we do do a pre-procedure echo to make sure that you know the amount of pericardial effusion, especially renal patients, is usually some. So we actually quantify that beforehand. And the other trip tips that I can share is to use the co-registration function uh, in IVUS uh, that you can actually use and therefore also be useful for that. I'm going to open up the discussion to our panellists. Um, maybe I, I can bring in Dr. Park. Dr. Park, can you, do you want to comment on this? Do you have much experience in using minimal ultra low contrast or no contrast in PCI? Actually, I don't have uh, experience over zero contrast PCI. I wonder, uh, uh, I, I have a question to Dr. Nata So, yeah. yes. How many days after contrast exposure is safe to perform zero contrast PCI? And the another one is the during zero contrast PCI, how do you check if the guiding is well engaged? In you know, guide is engaged by the, you have, you have to see the previous angiogram on your screen. You should have a screen angiogram or an angiogram documented in the another computer. And you should actually uh, cannulate the catheter exactly with the same projection, same angle, and just put the catheter by understanding the calcium and just put the wire inside, you will understand that you are in the true in the vessel and you have to check the wire in two different projections if you have two projections already by the angiogram earlier and if you have an ost osteal disease if you wanted to put a stent you have to put a put a wire into the sinus wire and just keep the wire outside and then put we had three or four patients has osteal disease in rc as well as lmc the other the other wire basically acts as a walking stick uh, you know so I'm just going to uh, bring in Dr. Lee and Dr. Tanarat to see if you have any comments from our other two expert panels on this case. Um, I don't have comments, just only uh, some questions. Uh, is there any case that uh, 
you uh, will don't do the uh, minimum or zero uh, contrast. And do you have any contraindication for this kind of procedure? Because I think it's a, your procedure that you present is quite complicated because you have left main, you have bifurcation, you have a uh, rotor beta. Do you have any case that you won't be doing this uh, minimum or zero contrast PCI? And a patient, actually any patient with the uh... EGFR less than 30, a patient has a very high chance of dialysis. If you can do a zero contrast PCI, that is always the best solution. And there is no contraindication in that level. Only thing is actually if you are not, uh, if you wanted to do some check and then it will become ultra low contrast because it will be less than EGFR. And whatever the level of contrast, the ideal, the ultimate aim is to use the contrast to be as minimum as possible. If you can, with the absolute zero, it is okay. We have done a lot of ultra-low contrast PCI, but this is the number we have done in the last six months. There's 22 patients completely free of contrast. Even then, two patients, we have to go for using small contrast to check some patients when the patient complained of severe chest pain. Okay, um, that's really good. I, I'm going to uh, close the session now because we are running a little bit behind schedule. Um, this is a global partner session, and indeed, I'm really pleased to see so many uh, good friends and new colleagues uh, from really across uh, Asia Pacific joining me. Um, you know, I, I'd like to thank um, all of you. Uh, some really interesting case looking at diabetes, aortic stenosis, validating the use of different resting indices, and finally, also a really interesting talk on minimal or no contrast uh, PCI. I'd like to thank my co-chair, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Chang, uh, uh, and also our you know, expert panelists uh, from uh, Thailand, Dr. Thailand, Dr. Lee, and also uh, Dr. Park from Korea uh, and Taiwan. Thank you very, very much, everyone. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.